United Sessions, Monday night tradition unlike any other, season three, episode 11. I'm Lucas Catch, we stay with Lisa Carl. We'll get to the in a second. First and foremost, DWC, how are you? I'm doing good, I'm doing good. It's uh, always a nice way to get through the Monday, uh, hanging out with friends here. You and producer Linnea, producer Jay, and today we're joined by another friend. Another Mr. friend, Mr. Greg Hurst. Greg Hurst, how are we? Welcome in. Thank you, thanks for having me. Excited to have you in here. Um, Producer Linnea, cheers in the background. <laughs> Thank you, studio audience. Uh, welcome in. One of United's newest strikers added in the offseason. Excited to have you here. Um, we got people in the chat who are, who are already saying hello. Hello, everybody there. Cassandra, David, everybody, hello. Um, but no, excited to have you here. You've played a couple matches already with the black and yellow, a couple preseason, a couple regular season. How are you settling in? Yeah, not settling in really well. Um, it was pretty easy transition um, coming in. All the boys, the coaching staff, made it really easy for the new guys coming in. It's a great group of guys as well, which always makes it easier. So kind of, you know, fit right in. And <clears throat> I think that's the most important part is, you know, being able to feel comfortable in, in and around the locker room straight away. You can uh, relax and be able to do your own thing. So really easy transition. And uh, just looking forward to keep getting playing more games. We we'll, want to get to the news of the day before we dive in too deep. About an hour ago at the time of this recording, if you're watching live, Milo Garanya. Added as the latest addition to the New Mexico United roster. Uh, Milo, Albuquerque native, uh, went to UNC Chapel Hill for his college. Just graduated there after five years. Five years ago with the Top yeah. Heels. Yeah. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on Milo on and off the pitch? How's he been? Yeah, no, a really good player. Um, <clears throat> I think they kind of touched on it in the announcement that he's very versatile. Uh, playing the left, playing the right, really technical. And a uh, really good addition to the squad. So excited to see where, like, how he kicks on a little bit. And... Uh, I'm looking forward to watching him play. And from watching in the preseason, uh, Milo, he really can bounce all around the midfield, right? Yeah. He's saw him, he played CDM, played kind of a central midfielder, played on the left, played on the right. How crucial is having somebody like that on the roster? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important. I think you need a couple of guys that can play more than one position. Um, you know, it's a long season, open cup, uh, league games. So a lot of stress in the body and... You know, it's hard to play those 34 games. Uh, so you need players that can fill in and play in different positions. Um, and obviously he's proven that already, playing a couple of positions. So it's really good to have him in. And like you said, really versatile and really good quality on the ball as well. So it's exciting to have him in. Utility well, guy. Well, from those hard-hitting three questions, we can tell you really know this game. And it's probably been ingrained with you for a long time. Talk to us about sort of the genesis of everything. How did this game come to be a part of your life? How did it become so important? Pretty much immediately. Um, you know, my dad and my mom's got photos of me kicking around with the ball since I could walk. Um, and it's a big, my family's a big football family. You know, even my mom's got her teams that she supports and watches football religiously as well. Um, my brother and my dad both play, or my dad played. Um, so kind of instantly, as soon as I could walk, I was kicking a ball and just fell in love with it straight away. I think going through school, it was no doubt in my mind that there was only one, one kind of career path for me. And I kind of tried to give it everything to do that. Um, you know, my mom told me I had to stick in school just in case it didn't work out. So I tried to do that as best as I could. But in the back of my mind, that was kind of, for me, that was the only really option. Um, and I'm thankful enough that I'm 25, turning 26 soon, and I'm still playing the game. Do you guys uh Scottish Premier League fans, Celtic Rangers, anybody? I'm a big Rangers fan. There it is. So is my brother and my dad, and my mom's a Celtic fan. Oh, so no. There's a little, there's divide. A little family there's strife. There's a little divide on that. That's awesome. Sundays. Um, and then Premier League, me and my dad are my night fans. My mom's a Newcastle fan. Well, you guys are fighting for fourth right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I know that match the other day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not the best moment. <laughs> the I'm sure you heard about it. Yeah. Um, but no, just, you know, I'll watch any game that's on TV, whether it's USL midweek game or, you know, whatever I can get. Love the game. Yeah. Well, we've talked to players in the past. I'm thinking of, of, of Michael Farvo. He's, uh, he's not come on the podcast, but I've talked to him in the past and he, he likes playing the game, but he doesn't really watch it a ton. And it's interesting to see that, right, from a professional player. Different ends of the spectrum, right? You you love the game. I love the game. Uh, I'm not a professional player. Not a professional player. Uh, but, you know, you love the game, and, and Mike's on the other end. Do you find kind of a wide variety, or do you find uh, in your teammates most of them are, are pretty obsessive like you? Um, I think most of them do enjoy watching it. Um, more so like the Premier League or La Liga, Champions League. I think the yeah. World Cup just happened as well. And, Obviously, I think that final, the Argentina-France final, might be one of the best games, or probably is the best game I've ever watched. What a match. Um, history made, you know, when Messi lifting the trophy, I think 
the majority of people wanted that. I'm a big Ronaldo guy, but for me, Messi is the best player in the world. Yeah. Um, and I think watching him what lift that trophy, I think kind of cemented that. And, he needed that. Yeah, he needed for sure. That World Cup, for um, sure. But yeah, I think most of the boys really enjoy the game um, and enjoy watching it. Maybe not to the degree that they'll sit and watch a USL midweek game on a Wednesday. I, um, <laughs> I forced my missus to watch one last week and she wasn't best pleased, but I don't know, it's just something about it. I just enjoy watching football. Yeah. Um, and I think most of the boys are like that, but you do get it. I, I've played with and know a lot of guys that as soon as they leave the training field or the game on a Saturday, they're just not interested. And that's fine. Yeah. You know what? you got to find a way to, to make a living. Exactly. If, if it's through the game and you don't care about the game beyond your own scope, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah I think there's that. a lot of players that have played top level that have openly said that they don't like football. Yeah. But they're just good at it. <laughs> they can make money doing it. So. Great. That's incredible. Um, so we're seven minutes in, so that means it's time for a really ridiculous question to take us right out of the left field. But I almost, <laughs> I almost blame you for this because you brought it up. You said, you know, when I was young, there was never really a plan B. It was always going to be, you know, professional footballer. What would be the plan B? Um, what would Greg Hurst do if he couldn't be a professional footballer? I like this question. This is good. I done. I kind of got interested in business management when I was at school. That was kind of one thing that I actually enjoyed. Um, but having grown up and developed, I've started to just enjoy golf a lot more. Um, <laughs> well, I well no, you can't say not professional no, football no, no. or professional golfer. I think it would probably be the, oh my the best golf courses in the world are in Scotland. Come on. <laughs> That's very true. That. It's the birthplace of the game, but that is a ridiculous answer. That and you can't be a professional footballer, so you say professional golf. If you're good at it, you're good at it. <laughs> I'm not I'm not the greatest. <laughs> I think if I if I played a lot more when I was younger, I think I'd be all right. But yeah. I think if it was outside the sport, it would probably be in the business management kind of thing. Um, like running think, your own business? I don't know if I could deal with the stress of that. Yeah. But definitely <laughs> something in that kind of area. Um, but for me as well, like going beyond football, I think like that kind of role would, if it was in sports as well, that would be even better. But I've always just enjoyed like kind of business side of stuff. So I think that's where I'd probably try and look to go in there. So all the way down the road when you eventually are done with the game, I think that you pursue being an agent, maybe. Something like that, yeah, yeah, but I know a lot of managers don't like agents, so yeah. I know it's a tough job. Yeah, um, You kind of have to be, you have to have a thick skin for that. I think a lot of agents don't like managers either. Yeah, yeah. it's a difficult job. I don't think people give agents enough recognition for that. Yeah. Um, and I kind of get it on the manager side as well, uh, having to deal with them all the time. But maybe something in like scouting or yeah. um, GM role or even coaching as well, I think I kind of want to stay in the football it always is, and I always find it interesting, Lucas, to, we talk to players, and we brought up that, a similar question a lot, you know, what do you want to do when you're done with the game? And there's so many players that bring up something in the game, but it's rarely the same thing, right? Like, so we've heard agent, we've heard coaching, that's the one we've heard probably more right. often than others, but we've heard broadcaster. Creative. We've heard creative. We've yeah. heard, some, uh, Austin Yearwood uh, is going to be a team president one day. Oh, you did. And like, bet. Those kind of things. Now, those kind of things. It's, it's so yeah. interesting to see, right? All these players are like, yeah, I want to be around the game in this different way. It's cool to have those different. It's not all about being a player, right? Being a player is incredible while well, you can do it. But how do you find work? How do you find life beyond the game in that way while still staying around the game? Well, and just pulling back the curtain a little bit, I think that was our goal from the beginning in, in having this podcast, right? It's mm -hmm. like, yes, we can talk about games. We can talk about stats and I'll be horrible at it and <laughs> I will seem like an idiot. Or we can really get to know these players' stories, who they are, really what makes them tick. And so I love that I asked you that question. I'm sorry that I hit your mic. Um, but I love the question because it's like, how does that, how do you think that like proclivity for business or that understanding of business, how does that translate to how you play on the field, right? Because I think a lot of people take their natural skill set and it manifests itself in the way they play. How does your business acumen manifest itself in the way you play? It's a good question, to be honest. And I think for me, a lot of football Thank you is. For being honest. <laughs> um, for me, it's I approach football kind of differently to anything else in life. I kind of just I go out, I play on a lot of instinct, um, and I'm kind of trying to clear my head before games. I don't want to get too bogged down with like certain things, and I want to kind of you know play freely. Um, and obviously, you have a system that we play, and you have a role in that system. But I think an important part of that for me is also showing you know a side to me that isn't just set in stone. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was in school and I was doing business stuff, it was different for me. It was more, you know, following a structure and trying to develop plans or whatever. Um, and that was a really, I, I enjoyed that side of it. 
But when I got the chance to be a footballer, I was like, I can't, I can't turn that down. Yeah, um, of course. So well, I think it's two different things to bring in together, but mm-hmm. I think I like having the opposite of each. Um, you know, in football, I like to be a little more free and kind of do things off the cuff if I can or create something. Um, and then in business, you know, you're trying to follow a plan or try to create a plan to get an angle, which is kind of similar for like a coach or a, or a team in general. That's kind of similar for a business person, right? You're developing angles to try and achieve goals. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not on the pitch. It's not necessarily as physical or athletic, but I wouldn't say the strategy is really that, all that different. Yeah. Got a question here from Robert Romero in the chat. If you have questions for for Greg Hurst, uh, throw them in the chat as well. Robert wants to know if you're better than bees at golf. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I found out this handicap the other day and I can't believe it. Um, I think I'm off like 13, 14 on a good day and I know he's scratch off scratch so yeah he's very good um i don't know what any of that <laughs> so just real quick it means he will make a par more often than not oh wow. not on yeah. yeah he's the that that's good yes can, yeah you you make it in the amount of strokes you were me and hers are very similar in that like we need a one or two stroke buffer okay uh, so if it's a par four par for you is a five or a six pretty much yeah okay that for, makes me, sense. It's, for me, it's like an eight. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, I'll take a five or six. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, want to talk to you a little bit about kind of your, I guess, your journey here, right? So we talked about you loving the game from a young age. You yourself, before you made it to the USL Championship uh, with Phoenix Rising, prior to that, you were in USL League One, Union Omaha, champions there. Take us through what that was like. Yeah, that was obviously a pinnacle of my career so far, just left in trophy like silverware. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we won the league and then won the won the championship. Um, I think a lot of us were kinda winning the league kinda got overlooked a little bit because you don't get like a trophy or anything for it. You just kinda it's get how it works in the US, right? You just get it's a mark saying congratulations. Um but for the UK boys or the European boys that are in that team, for us winning the league is like That's well, it. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. You know, you you've won a league over However many weeks of the season you've been consistent, the most consistent team picked up the most points, and then championship, no matter if you finish first or fourth or sixth or whatever. It's like a cup tournament. You don't have to win two or three games to win it. Right. Um, so, But we won the most in the league and won the regular season. And then, you know, I think it was kind of a testament the last the semi-final, the semifinal and the final. Obviously, we beat us on 6-1 in the semi-final, and then Greenville 3-0 in the final. So it's pretty we were 9-1 we in two games. Yeah. Um, I think it kind of we hit the ground running really towards the end of the year. We had a little lull in the middle of the season, but there was no doubt in my mind with the team that we had um, that we were going to achieve something good that year. And obviously, it kind of all prevailed. Um, but yeah, it was a phenomenal year, and I definitely look back on that, and it's kind of shaped my ambition as well. You know, I don't want to just finish my career with that. You know, I want something else. More trophies, because um, that feeling and boys that have won stuff will not like the feeling. It's, it's unmatched when you when you look back on it. So I definitely want to feel that again. Well, you grew up in a region that is an established football culture, right? Like whether it's Scotland, whether it's the English Premier League, whatever it is, like you grew up around that. But America has always sort of been a little bit further behind that. I'm curious your thoughts on as a player in it and as someone who's experienced a developed system, how important is something like USL League One to grow in the game in the states, yeah, I think it's it's massive. Uh, it's so important, and I think I think it's getting better now. But I feel like when I first came over, it was kind of getting overlooked a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, no one really wanted to join League One teams, and no one was really taking anyone from League One teams. But there's some very good players there, and I think you look at this year, especially there's a lot of Championship players that have went down there. And, <clears throat> uh, I've signed for teams in League One, and there's a lot of League One players from the last year or so that have came up and. Um, fit into championship teams and not just became squad players that came in and had starting spots in championship teams. Um, So I think the level is definitely getting better and better. Um, And, you know, I still watch a lot of the games and the talent and the ability in that league is is very good. I don't think it's far off. Obviously, it's a smaller league, but I definitely think that it's closer than people think it is. I really don't think there's much of a gap between the quality of players in League One and and the championship top to bottom. I think the biggest difference between the two is just the amount of money invested by the club. Right, exposure. That, that's, yeah. yeah. I mean, ultimately, you got yeah. players like Cello Martinez, who was here, and then he was in R- RGB, then here, then RGB again. A hell of a player, one of the best passers in the league. He's playing for forward Madison yep. this year. He's, he's a championship level quality player. Alex Touche, another example. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he he was uh, he did really well in the Open Cup. Scored, scored a match winning goal in the Open Cup against the MLS club. Yeah. You know, like these are these 
there, I don't think there's a, a hard and fast demarcation line between League One and Championship, really. I don't think it exists. Well, and I don't want to be a show for the league, but I do think <clears throat> it is something that I give them credit for. They, sure. they have said we want to build this developmental pyramid. Everything. Does That's not, how you grow the game in the state. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We want the championship to be successful. That's obviously our marquee product, but that doesn't become the marquee product it is without USL League One, without USL League Two, without the academy, yep. without all of the efforts they've made to build a true pyramid. I think as well, like, the better League One gets, the better the championship gets. Oh, I think they push each other. Um, you know, and the more players that USL Championship can bring from League One, the better it looks for League One. So more players go there. Yeah. They know there's a pathway to get to the championship or maybe even further. So I just think it's a good thing. We need to grow the number of teams in League One. I think mm-hmm. first and foremost, that's, that's one of the things you got to find more markets. There's, for yeah, there's so many markets because that are League, ready for it. League yeah. Two is so big. League Two is yeah. the is the biggest pre-professional league in the world. Yeah, I can't believe that it was. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it's like 10 different leagues in one. And then you go from that to League One, which is, what are they at right now? Eight, nine, ten teams, something like that. It's a uh, small it's team. Nine, right. ten. I think yeah. it's eight, yeah, eight to ten. It's small. Yeah, it's small. But if you can grow that, if you can get that league to twenty teams, and then you can have the championship in twenty teams, then you can have a conversation about pro. Well, be that. careful. Be careful, David. That's important. It's it important is. to have that conversation. It's how you grow the game. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Need a cough button. We're gonna dive right into that. Uh, we're gonna dive into more than that uh, in segment two. Right after this, stick around on United Session. Segment two, United Sessions, season three, episode 11, lots of numbers. Welcome in. We're here with Greg Hurst, striker for New Mexico United. Greg, thanks for being here. Of course, thanks for having me. All right, so we were talking a little bit right before the break uh, about the growth of the game in the States. Um, Again, you've seen multiple levels of that game here in the States. Uh, League One, USL Championship. In your mind... What, what is the key to continuing to grow the game so that it, it can compete in kind of historical nature uh, and, and the growth level that we've seen in, in places like Scotland, in, in places like the English Premier League? For real? Yeah, there it is. I think, good, good lad. I think it is essential for, you know, growing the game. Um, I know it's hard in America because it's such a big country um, to be doing East Coast to West Coast. I mean, if you go into, you know, the, I don't know how they work it by merging the two, the west and the east. But if you're if you have two, three back to back games on the opposite coast, it can get a lot for players traveling. But sure. I think if it, we do it anyway, yeah, I it's, mean, it's really. pretty much set up there. The MLS is doing it. Yeah, I mean, you Philadelphia Union played uh, LA LAFC the other day. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a hell of a lot of travel. It does probably come down to funding um, and having the resources to do it. But I think going ahead, I think the the bigger the league get, and it's only going. It's only getting more exposure and more exposure. Sure. Just like we talked about the League One and Championship, you know, they're just getting more and more popular. I think if it continues going that way, then I think eventually they will have the resources to go and do it. But I think for me coming over here, it was strange that to I, not have to it. not have that because yeah. you could see it. You know, my first year in League One, you'd be playing against them, um, like the academy MLS teams before they went MLS Next right. Pro, and you know, you'd have maybe seven or eight games left, and they were bottom of the league and. 
maybe a 15 point tough second ball. What do they have to play for? And you play against them, and if, if you scored early against them, it was kind of like, oh, well, that's just another game for them. Um, you know, there's still nothing to fight for, um, which I think doesn't benefit the players. It doesn't benefit the fans either. No. You know, think about it. If you've got, you've got a club that is, say you've got a 20 team league, you've got a club that's in 15th, 16th, and 17, uh, 19, 18, 19, 20 are going down. Now, all of a sudden, those matches matter. Where if you don't, then oh, we're in 15th. There's no way we're going to make the postseason. What's the point? It, it was mind blowing to me. You guys are both like lifelong fans, and so this was like something you almost grew up in, right? Like a fish in water. But when I first came to the game and I learned about the mechanism of promotion relegation, I was, I was struck. Like, oh my god! Like that makes the end of the season so much more interesting. For everyone, like, everyone is yeah, interested yeah. in it. Like I. I love the the competition at the top of the table, but I would almost say I'm more compelled by like the promotion relegation battles. Like that's sure. the one that I'm just like that's incredible. Well, they they've changed everything now, particularly yeah. in a in a season like this season in the Premier League where you've got seven or eight teams yeah. that could be that could go down. Yeah. I mean that makes it fun towards the end of the year. I'm gonna I mean, I'm gonna be watching Leeds now when I wouldn't have been watching Leeds before exactly. because they're they're a relegation battle. I'm gonna be watching Southampton. I'm be watching Bournemouth. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have cared. But all of a sudden they met. I think if you look at the West Coast last year, you know, the last month and a half, the difference between fifth place and bottom wasn't a lot. Right. And that was exciting enough. But imagine also you had relegation to consider as well. Whether yeah. it was one team or two teams, you know, just well, that added extra. Well, and what you can add on top of that in terms of programming, in terms of sure. the tournament, in terms of sponsorships. I yeah. mean, like it just it, it, it to me is a no brainer, but I also understand it's a it's a very complex mechanism and there's a lot of factors in play. Yeah, and, and I think one of those, probably the biggest one, is is, is the money, right? Obviously, yeah. and part of that's the travel that you mentioned, Hersey. But part of it is also if, if you come in at a certain price point in the higher league, what's your incentive to want to be in a system where you could lose that uh, and go down? Why not to start at the lower level and work your way up, right? So the, the owners of the teams that have come in at a higher level aren't going to necessarily be incentivized to potentially lose value if their teams don't perform well. My opinion on that is it's a bunch of bullpucky. Um, because that gives them incentive to work hard, to put a good product on the field, to, you know, to really actually provide their communities with something to get to rally behind uh, and, and to win, frankly. And that, that's what makes it all exciting. If, if everybody is actually competing to win and not just in it to, to make dollars, it's a better product for fans. Yeah, and, I totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah so awkward transition but I, <laughs> but i think it, it it fits in nicely to this because again we're talking about the tradition of the game the tradition of the sport how people have become acclimated to it you have had your fair share of stops along the way yeah. and so i guess i'm pretty curious and i think we should share with the audience what does that journey look like the the uh, we talked about early days you're kicking the ball you're you're a, a, a plucky young lad uh, but but what do those first sort of organized, um, more structured systems look like for you? They're difficult. Um, <clears throat> I have said like a lot of people ask me like if I have a if I have a kid one day and it's uh, and I have a son, you know, they'll make them play, try and get professional football. And honestly, I don't know the answer to that because the, the kind of stuff you go through as a young kid, especially in like a, a UK setup, it can be quite a lot of that age mm -hmm. to deal with. And um, there is a lot of rejection. Obviously, you see some kids just blow through academies and sure. get to the first team straight away, but it's so minuscule. Like the chances of that happening are so low. Um, but yeah, like you said, I've had a, f a fair few share of disappointments, and there was one point when I got released from being um, full time back home in Scotland. Um, we kind of had a sit down chat with the, with the manager, and he said that I'd just come off an injury, and he was like, "We're going to bring in a couple of experienced players." Like I think I was twenty one at the time, twenty, and that was kind of a year where I had to break through and mm -hmm. start playing regular first team football. I've been on a lot of loans, and I was kind of over getting loaned out to like League Two, League One. You know, I wanted to play at a good level, um, and he said that the chances would be limited. So we agreed that you know we mutually parted ways, and that kind of hit me really hard. I was kind of to the point where I spoke to my dad one night, and I was like. I think I might just go part time and get my, like just get a normal job yeah. and just stop pursuing professional football. And that was at that age, it was kind of a difficult decision for me to make, and I wasn't sure like where my life would go after that. Um, so I went and played part time for three or four months. That team that was in a relegation battle. Um, eventually, ended up getting relegated on the last day, <laughs> um, which also compounded the feeling. I was like, I never want to feel like this again. Right. So it was either oh. to stop playing. So I don't have to go through this again, or do I try something different? Yeah. Um, and luckily enough, a player that I played with had played in America for years, played in MLS, and 
you know, an assistant coach in the US and he just came up to me one day and he was like, I have this guy looking for, you know, younger players that are interested in going out to America. And I thought, if I'm going to do something, I might as well do that. You know, just an entirely different continent, going to start fresh where no one knows me or like knows my background or anything. And was that hard to do? Get away from your family like that? Yeah, it was. Yeah. I didn't. I was really excited at the time. And just the idea of going out to America. I always wanted to come to America. Sure. Um, so when I got the opportunity, I was really excited about it and couldn't wait to get going for two or three months. Because the transfer windows were a bit different. It yeah. took time to get out and get everything finalized and obviously visas and stuff like that. Um, eventually got out to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and the GM was... What, a, what a place. <laughs> Love the place. Yeah, I, 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 I've, I've loved I've been camping in Chattanooga. Yeah, yeah. great place. Yeah. Um, but the GM was driving me around for about an hour, just showing me things. And the whole time I was sitting in the front of the car just thinking, ah, I just want to go home. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I was like, I don't know if this is for me. Yeah. First couple of weeks were a bit difficult. Um, and then just kind of, you know, I was sitting in my room one night and I was just like, I'm here. You know, it was only, it was towards the end of the season. I think it was maybe six or seven weeks. Um, and I was like, just make the most of it and see yeah. what happens. That's and right. now, four years later, I have no intentions of going back home and, you know, my mom and dad know that and they love that I'm out here. They come out and visit every year. Wow. Um, so it's nice for them to come out and spend two weeks in a different city every time they come out. Um, when are they coming out this year? What match? Probably, we have the four home games in August, so they're probably going to come out for those four. Nice. Um, in August is a great time to be in Perfect time. Yep. Yeah. So, well, no, like, there is a lot of hits and, and bumps in the road, um, but I think it's important that players that are grown up know that. Like, it's not the end of the world. Um you will get over them and whether you choose to go in a different direction or stick with it it's totally up to you and there's no wrong decision i don't think um but i just decided to keep going with it and see see where it went and this is probably like the last four years have probably been the happiest four years of my career in well, terms of how i felt playing we're very grateful that you kept with it yeah we're happy to have you here no kidding but i mean again we've had a lot of these conversations with the players and Again, everyone is unique. Everyone has a different, you know, path that led them to where they're at right now. But it seems like a red thread throughout all of it is this resiliency, this grit, like this thing that just says if you get knocked down ninety nine times, get up a hundred. And, and and I I don't know where does that come from from you? Is that is that a product of your parents? Is that a product of just the the geography you grew up in? Why why are you tough? I think a lot of it probably comes from my dad uh, and my brother as well. Uh, he's he was a brilliant player when he was younger. Um, had a couple of bad injuries that stopped him playing inevitably, but you know, I just watching him growing up and he kind of never wanted to stop. Um, and I saw that and I eventually did stop playing. Um, and I kind of walked, I, I looked at that and I thought, you know, like if that ever happens to me, like how am I going to feel? Yeah. Um, but taking <clears> his <throat> advice from what he'd been through, my dad's advice as well, really kind of just gave me that a bit more passion and desire to kind of fight through whatever came whether it was not getting a contract or getting released or it's part of football at the end of the day, you know, it happens to the majority of football players. It doesn't go the way you think it's going to go when you're a kid. You know, you just, you watch the Premier League and the Champions League and you think, if I'm a professional footballer, that's going to be me one day. When in reality, it's about 1% of the 1% that make it. Yeah. So, you know, you have to... 1% of 1% even become professional. Yeah. yeah. I mean, really, think about all the, the millions of people that play football around the world. You know, just becoming a pro at any level, is you know beyond imagination as far as numbers go and then to to get to that level just it's almost non-existent yeah yeah got a couple things in chat here for you andrew bolte who is a big rochdale fc fan there we go uh, andrew the only one uh, <laughs> one of a few one of a few he says yes to promotion no to relegation up the dale uh, that's how we get the year, like, with 75 teams in it um tyler ortega has a question he said uh, how many times has Greg been called Chris since arriving? Then for context, yeah. Chris Hurst is one of our commentators, our color commentator on the English broadcast on, on TV. Yeah. I actually, funny enough, texted Greg a few weeks back with uh, something for Chris. I was like, just make sure you're there at this time. And Greg's like, what are you talking what? about? Yeah. What? I don't even think I was here yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't think you were in your town. Yeah. Um, no, I've been called Chris a couple of times, but um, as well as I don't know, is it, Have you me. met Chris Hurst? Not yet. He's well, good. Oh, he's, he's a good, good dude. Everybody exactly. says he's a good lad. So yeah, he sat right in that chair on the podcast a few weeks ago. So uh, yeah, you guys are brethren. <laughs> he's good people. Anything else out of the chat, Dave? No, that's it for now. Keep okay. it coming. All right. Um, why New Mexico United? Okay, so we kind of charted the course up to this point right now. 
great successful season, uh, USL League One champion, uh, season of Phoenix, and then something happens over the offseason. Someone reaches out to you, someone says, hey, you've got this opportunity. What about it stuck out most in your mind? following his best friend something. <laughs> no, obviously, I don't kind of touch on it too much, but last year, in terms of the way we were at Phoenix, it wasn't a successful season, so we knew changes were coming. Um, and, you know, there was a chance that I was going to get traded, um, and I knew New Mexico were interested, and they'd been interested before when I was at Omaha. Um, so to kind of hear that they were interested again, and it was kind of... You know, it's more than once. Yeah, yeah. As a player, we still like you, man. Yeah, that feeling is that you're wanting. Um, I think that's for anybody. Right? Yeah, like, oh, it's nice to know. Yeah. yeah. So for two, two and a half years, they were still keeping tabs and checking up and trying to get me here. So for me, <clears throat> for me, that was a big thing. Um, spoke to Zach on the phone. He said, you know, obviously we wanted you here, and we've got the chance to get it done now. How are you feeling about it? And you know, I was excited. Um, I think it's a great club. What great year last year. Um, <clears throat> always difficult to play against. I think everybody knows best fans in the league. Can't wait to play in front of them. Um, Coming up here real soon. For me, like that's one thing as well that I buzz off a little bit. Like a good ground with like good fans, a lot of fans. I think for any professional in their sport, that's what they want. You know, they want a big crowd and a lot of fans supporting them. So that was a that was a big attraction as well. Obviously, bringing Santi in, um, someone I'm familiar with, a good good friend of mine. So looking at the team and. You know, just adding to that, it looked like a, such a strong roster, and I just I was excited to get here and get started. Every single year, there's been a player, and, and again, I won't spill any names. I don't want to embarrass them I won't. unnecessarily. But there's been a player that you see them the first time they warm up in front of the crowd, right? And even the warm ups, like you gotta, like you gotta remember this is the land of Manana, and so like a, not a lot of folks show up in time for warm ups. But even then, it's yeah. wild, and you will inevitably look out on the warm-up area and there's someone that is, they're just being. So one of one of my favorite moments every single year is after you guys have finished warming up, you've gone back into the tunnel. And as Lucas said, during warm-ups, we, we've got a late arriving crowd. It's big crowds, but they're late arriving. They're like tailgate right up to, to kick off and then they come in. The first match of the season, first home match of the season at Isotopes Park, watching the players come out of the tunnel, particularly the new guys and have like, to see their eyes. Yeah. It's like, oh, Wow, and it just—I don't know—it it fills me with a little bit of pride as a New Mexican. Like, yeah, we can put we can put this show on, uh, and then yeah, it's excitement. It's excitement. I remember I remember seeing that particularly in year one when everybody was out there for the first time, our first ever home match, and just watching that happen is—I I felt such a pride. In that. Well, more than one of them said, and I don't even have to embarrass them to say this, but more than one of them said it took a while to get settled into sure. that game. Yeah, like just based off of everything, because again. Jules Myers puts on a hell of a pregame show, right? It'd yep. be hard to not get pumped out coming out of that. If, if, if you're not pumped out when all that stuff happens, you probably don't have a soul. But then everyone, the flags waving, the smoke bombs going off, uh, just everything across the board, the, the traditions that we have, the call and response that we have on the, uh, on the announcement, like it, uh, I'm, I'm getting pumped, man. Yeah. I'm <laughs> a couple of weeks. excited for you to experience that the first time. I can't wait. Like for me, that's football. Um, especially like the culture and the, and Albuquerque already, I can tell that it's the club that you know the fans love the club. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's that's one of the biggest things. When people aren't just there to support and have a good time, but they're there because they want to see the club succeed. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of support. And I think the, like the players, as players, we know that. Yeah. So it does give us that extra five ten percent during games, um, and hopefully we can do that this year and push on as, as far as we can. Yeah. All right. So New Mexico so far, you've been here for what three four months now ish mm -hmm. around there. Start of February. So okay, so two two and a half to around there. Yeah. What are your impressions so far? What are your favorite parts of the state? Is it food? Is it outdoors? Is it something else? First impression is it's totally different to anywhere else I've lived. Um, really cool and quirky. Uh, a lot of people said like give it a chance when you get here, but since I got here, I've loved it. Um, I think it is what you make it. And Agreed. I just there's just the whole vibe and culture around here. I really enjoy it. Um, even just going to local coffee shops. You know, a lot of us after training. Just jump in someone's car, go for a coffee, hang out for another hour or so. Uh, we have a little group. We're kind of the dwellers. You know, it's training finishes and we're probably there for another hour and a half. Yeah. Just kind of hanging out and just chatting. Um, go and get some coffee. Um, and I feel like you can just do that here. You know, no problems. You can, there's so many coffee shops to go to, that kind of thing. Obviously, knowing Santi likes his outdoors, so yes. I'm sure he'll be 
tailing along with him at some point. I know there's a lot of nice outdoors. Do you have your bicycle there. yet? I don't have my bicycle, but he's kind of hinted a couple of times that I should, <laughs> should probably get one. Yeah. Um, I mean, he does. Too, actually. Actually. <laughs> he does. Um, and I love that as well. You know, I think part of the reason coming out to America was to see different places um, and not just live there and like move on, but experience what those places have to offer. And I definitely feel like I can do that here. Yeah. The line you said, uh, it just, it made my heart feel really, really good that you said, like, I'm here and I'm giving it a chance and I'm going to experience it and I'm going to make out of it what I can make out of it. Because you do that, yeah. you're going to find that New Mexico literally is the land of enchantment. Yeah. Like, you come into it and you realize, like, this is a pretty darn magical place with a bunch of magical people. Uh, I mean... Dave, you can speak better to it than me. I, I, again, I'm the, the fish in the fishbowl on it. Well, you yeah, you grew up here, right? Yeah. And yeah. So, but you also you didn't grow up in Albuquerque. You I grew up in Austin, New Mexico. Wildly different. And that is that is wild. It's a different country. Shout yeah. out West West Texas. <laughs> West West Texas. But no, I, I think I, I share uh, what you're talking about there, Hurst. You know, I, I moved here eight years ago, uh, and I and we've talked about this on the podcast before, so sorry to bore people. Um, but, I'm not sorry. <laughs> Listen. Pay attention. But no, uh, the first you know little while I was here, I, I came here because I was on a contract. Uh, and I, was, I didn't know anything about New Mexico or know any people who were here. Um, and I was like, I'll do my three-year contract on there. That'll be it. Um, and so for the first while that I was here, I was like, yeah, okay. I was a TV reporter, so I was seeing the worst of everything. It's like, oh, what is going on with this place? Like, there's murders and crime and corruption and all this stuff. And of course, you're going to see that as a TV reporter. But I wasn't giving it a chance. Um, and then. As I was kind of winding down, I had about a year left on that contract. I was like, you know what? Like you said, I'm here. I might as well enjoy it. Might as well take advantage of it and explore. And I did. I started exploring. I started meeting people. I started going places. I started checking out all the landmarks in the state and the forests and the mountains and the deserts and white sands and all these beautiful places. And I fell in love with it. Yeah. And to the point where, again, that was only a year left on my contract. When that contract was up, I, was, I didn't want to do TV anymore, but I wanted to stay here. Yeah. So I decided to stay and I fell in love with it. And uh, been here eight years now. Yeah, I think that's something I asked um because obviously he's a UK lad, mm -hmm. been here a while. And I said to him, I was like, "What's it like?" And that's exactly what he said. He's like, "It's what you make it. Like that's if right. you just get involved and you know have a good time, um, see what there is to see, do what there is to do, you, you'll love this place. You uh, get out exactly what you put in. Exactly. In this place. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm looking forward to our stupid silly game, uh, which is going to come around here right after this commercial break. We'll be back with segment three and Lucas's latest version of stupid silly game right after this. Stick around. Right. to close this thing down. The only way we know how to close it down was with really stupid silly game. So this is episode 11, season three, United Sessions. David Weezy Carl, Lucas Cash, Greg Hurst. You excited about this, man? I can't wait. Have you tuned into any of the other episodes to see how ridiculous this can be? 
a little bit, but I don't want to. I, You're looking at the I know. Sometimes I don't want to watch it all because I don't want to spoil the surprise. <laughs> I do. I, I will say, uh, during preseason, I, I went out with the lads to Tucson, and it was right after Will had been on the episode, mm-hmm. and there was some real discourse in the locker room Love about that. Will talking smack about Sergio's dance moves. Mm-hmm. Uh, that made me very happy. Yeah. Uh, this one, I don't think we'll have any anything like that. We don't want to get you in trouble in your first year here. That's fun. No. Uh, all right. Who's the biggest idiot? <laughs> Here's the thing we need to acknowledge, though, and, and we'll get to it when I when I read out the uh, the rules here. Uh, the tonight's game is uh, first and worst with Greg Hurst. Okay. It's always a play on the name and a rhyme. But you you actually kind of robbed me a little bit with social media captioning when you did her so good because I was like, ooh, I could come up with like her so pain. good. Is, is I, I think I could come up with pain disorders and that would have been a fun game. But Robert can't. Robert Romero in the chat would have appreciated. Oh, he would crush that. Her so good should be a chant for her. <laughs> Fans, you're listening. Her so good. There it is. We're gonna give you a topic. That's just really okay. You tell us the top of the class and the bottom of the class when it comes to the top and the locker. No, 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 no. That's a, no we're not. We're In not, general, we're okay. not going to get you into trouble. Like but maybe that. one, of, maybe one of them is like teenagers. It's not. But no. there's like that. The very. <laughs> you like that. Little spoiler good. alert. It's going to get. It's going to get a little controversial. Okay. okay, but it's going to be controversial in a fun way, and people are going to like it. <clears throat> so, Greg Hurst, first and worst in terms of genres of music. What's the best genre of music, and what's the worst genre of music? Best is country. Oh, wow. I didn't expect that. Yeah, I'm a big country guy. Okay. So I expected it because I did research. Were you a country music fan before you came to the States? No. Then give it a second thought. Okay. Um, what well, gotcha. Well, I'm in the chat. I'm You got a country. Like, after the games, like, we had, in my second year there, we didn't have floodlights. So we had to play at, like, 2 p.m. in the afternoon in the yeah. home games. So we had a lot of time after on a Saturday. There's always one bar we go to, yeah, and every bar was just country music, and the people there and the vibe was just. Um, Did you learn how to dance? Nah, see, I, country music is not my thing, but I will say the vibes around country music. If you go to like a country music yeah. bar, as long as it's not like a sketchy one, like there's there's like the vibes are great, like a backyard barbecue kind of vibe, especially if it's like live music. Yeah, and um, the people are great. It's funny, Steph just time. Steph just walked in. Uh, <laughs> Steph's a uh, <laughs> so friend of ours. She loves country music, uh, and I, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, I wish Steph was here. Here comes Steph. So he just his favorite genre is, is country music. There you go. My favorite artist though. What's Chris oh. Stapleton? Chris Stapleton. All right, he's oh, ready to go. Okay, that's Chris. This guy's ready. All right, all right. So bottom of the class for genres of music. What's your least favorite genre? It's definitely for one. I, I do like a lot of music, but I've yeah. got quite a diverse playlist. But polka. I'm trying to think. You know? He's like, I love polka. What are you talking about? I'm not big into rock music. Really? There's like a couple of songs that I'll get on with, but I'm not really. It's not really me. All right, so completely generalized. I feel like here, I feel like that's my job. I'm a little upset. With you. That's okay. <laughs> I, we're here to learn about you, not about me. Greg. Completely generalizing, I would have said the opposite. I would have thought you were a rock guy and didn't like country. I don't know why I would have. Thought. I don't have a reason for that. It's just I don't know what was in my brain. Well, it's weird because, like, like I said, like I never really listened to country. It's not. It's getting bigger back home. Like yeah. my mates love it now. Yeah. Um, but it's probably because of you. You're a when I was growing up, <laughs> when I was growing up, just, I'd hear it and I just kind of be like. Well, what did you like before you came to the states? What was, your, what was your go-to? Um, a lot of deep house. Okay. Um, That's Michelle very house. opposite. Yeah. Um, like, <laughs> Thanks, I, think Lucas. I I went to Ibiza one year for all season. Yeah. Um, I was with my brother and a few of my mates, and it was the best holiday ever. And it was a lot of deep house kind of music. Do you remember a lot of it? Some of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't, don't get him in trouble. Big Elvis fan as well. Oh, I love Elvis. Yeah. yeah. Elvis is probably one of my favorite. And artists. again, that, that kind of gets me so again, I'm not I'm not a country music guy, but some of the, the like classics, like Elvis isn't country per se, he's stole a lot for blues and rock and all that kind of stuff. But he's a country guy. Like uh Willie Nelson is in there for me. Uh again, Johnny Cash. These guys are are like classic country, outlaw country, I guess you'd call it. I like that. I like yeah. that one. Would you like to make a bet with me? I can tell you what Greg's favorite Elvis song is. Well, did you look it up? No. Okay. How, would I, how would I look up Greg Hurst's favorite Elvis I don't know, Elvis man. Song? You just Google it. Suspicious Minds. It used to be. Ah, I win the bet. No. It used to be. Is it, I've uh, been betrayed uh, by my secret source. Is it, uh, um, I'm going to say Tutti Fruit. It's a good song. Okay. Um, oh, I forgot the name of it. Oh, my God. That's terrible. Um, well, then I'm Heartbreak right Hotel. Suspicious no, Minds. Uh, Joe Hurst Rock. 
Okay. Yeah. I like that. I like your slower ones as well. I'll never forgive you when I'm this source. You can't you go made go me <laughs> <home. laughs> You made like yourself. Would you say that your source is giving you a suspicious mic? Don't look at the paper. <laughs> Come on. Saw that. What a cheater. All right. First and worst with Greg Hurst. Greg Hurst, give us the first and worst candy. First, this might be a weird one, actually. Swedish Fresh. That is a weird one. I don't know why. Put them in the fridge overnight. They get stuck in my teeth. Yeah. You put them in the fridge oh, to make them even harder? Well, they actually are better that way. I actually prefer them that way. Yeah. Because uh, they, they don't get stuck in your teeth as much yeah. when, you, when you put them in the fridge. I'm not liking how this is. <laughs> We're not here to judge. We're here to learn. I'm here to judge. Be curious, not judgmental. There you go. Um, all right. So I'm not a big chocolate guy, so I'm uh, more candy. Uh, no, I don't. I like Skittles as well. Do you like sugar free Skittles from Whole Foods? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> and yet they still keep selling, man. Um, all right. Bottom of the class. What's the worst? Light licorice. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, yeah, agree on that. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a crowd. If there's a black licorice defender in the chat, go ahead and get in there so we can permanently thank. Yeah, just go ahead. Just drop <laughs> it. Right. Yeah. All right. A bit of an alteration on the next one. Go ahead. Luke. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, first and worst with Greg Hurst. Scottish desserts. <laughs> All right. I, when you when you put, when, you put up, when you put this on the list, I was like, are there Scottish oh, desserts? Oh, I did. I, I did. Sure, at least eleven. Oh, I love sure, 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 sure. There were a lot of names I couldn't pronounce. I was going to write it out. Down, but there's a list of top 10 Scottish desserts. <laughs> Shortbread is one of my favorites. One of the producers can pull it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd be interested to know actually because I have no idea. So, <laughs> Scott, so shortbread, uh, Girl Scout, we just had Girl Scout cookie season. The tray foil, is my favorite Girl Scout. Oh, yeah, my so closet, or my pantry is full in right now. I'm missing a bunch of them. Was it because of the preseason game? Yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah you got so devastated like because of all the dirt. Yeah, yeah, like the only thing I could do is sad by Girl Scout. Oh, I'm the best. <laughs> she rules. Um, Laura Dune, those little girls, those little yeah. girls, little shortbread. Girls. Lorna Dunes, is that what they're called? No, I believe that's correct. They're so good. Oh, there's a lot of names for Scott. I can't. Yeah, there it is. There's a list right there. What about Clody? Clody? Clody Dumplings. Clody Dumplings. I've never heard of that. One. That's not real. <laughs> what are you looking up? Damn you, man. What else? <laughs> Dundee cake. Dundee cake. I've heard of that. I don't think I've ever had it though. Like crocodile dundee? Okay, this first one I That's don't not a knife. That's a, that's a strand. That's a cake that pulls a knife on you. I don't know how to say that. Cranishon? Cranishon? Never heard of it. No chance. I, I think it's, you got you got duped. No, I got Your bamboozled. <laughs> I got bamboozled in making this game. But you're you're actually your laptop desserts. is getting a virus right now. Uh, petticoat tails? <laughs> he looks. I've never heard for of the audio for the audio audience sure in a couple illegal. days. He, he looks. Scottish tea cookies. That seems oh, very yeah, good. That seems Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> like, big fan of Scottish <laughs> Snickers. Big yeah. fan of Scottish apple pie myself. Well, like, I don't know if, like, my parents are watching this back home just thinking. I mean, I they're all just, right. like, yeah, they know. begin with Scottish and then it's, like, Mac. Scottish. <laughs> yeah, Sc I do have some bad news, everybody. We do have a defender of black licorice in the chat. Uh-oh. Lucinda, we love you very oh, much. Oh, Lucinda, we, no. We love you, but you know what? You're, you're entitled to your opinion. We just we don't have to agree with it, but we love you, and that's okay. Uh, Robert Romero, Scotch and sweet Scotch, <laughs> for, for your Scotch <laughs> Perfect, I love that. That's funny because that's actually what my mind went to. Like, that's oh, the only thing I think of. There you go. That's like, that's what most <laughs> that makes sense to me. All right, we're moving on. What a disastrous question. <laughs> okay, we're moving on. Uh, first and worst, of Greg Hurst, give us your first and worst workouts at Elevate. With the understanding that the workouts you dislike most are potentially maybe the best ones for you? Yeah, I mean, Elevate's great. Yeah, I think the awesome. fact that we can use that facility is so important for us. Um, I think after a hard week, when you get the Elevate shout, you're a bit like, <sighs> you're a bit tired, but once you get through it, you always feel better for it. Um, anything legs is the worst. But <laughs> well, I mean, you're running probably all the, time, the most yeah. beneficial. Um, and then the best ones are the, you know, the more mobile ones, you know, stretching and but upper body pull ups, that kind of stuff. Stuff that isn't too difficult, but you can get through it. Um, but the leg ones, anything like trap bar or explosive stuff, probably the most beneficial, but the hardest to get done. Yeah, the one where we came out and filmed with you guys, and oh, it, it literally seemed like torture to me. Yeah, yeah, every time the camera like, was close to me, I was like, <laughs> I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> They're like, We want you to jump up and down a lot, which is hard enough, but also we're going to put all these weights on you. Too. Yeah. I'm yeah. surprised someone didn't come out with like a wiffle ball bag. Job, just to add to the torture of it. For me, at the gym, I agree. I hate leg press. I 
hate light press. I hate it. I hate it. But I really like, even though I, I probably doesn't have the most benefit for me, I really like a dumbbell curl because it just feels good. Yeah. It feels good. Feel like I'm getting jacked. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Like I don't know. It, it looks good in the mirror. And but it also feels good. Yeah. You know, if you're struggling with a squat and everybody's watching. Yeah, well, it's tough to get through. Oh, it's bad. But I mean, the dumbbell curl is just yeah, it's a dumbbell curl. Yeah. That's why I exclusively worked out at home because I didn't want anyone to burn me or see how terrible I look. No, I but you got that accountability. But no, but then, Roger, right. but then Roger comes out and he's like, "Are you okay, <laughs> Dad? You've been yelling a lot. <laughs> why are you sweating so much?" <laughs> All right, uh, moving on from workouts to the exact opposite of workouts, Lucas. Oh yeah, this is my wheelhouse. Beer. First and words with Greg Hurst. Oh, worse is one back home called Carling. Oh, I've had Carling. I don't oh, think it's that bad. It's, it's just boring. Great. It's not great. Yeah, it's just boring. Um, There's a whole tournament named after them. Yeah, that is true. All right. Um, <laughs> first, first a good one, actually. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of good beer. Yeah, absolutely. Especially um, in Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Um, see, to be honest, see, recently, I used to hate Guinness. I love Guinness. But recently, I don't know why. It's... I'll tell you why I love Guinness. Because so I love stouts. That's stouts and porters are my two favorite types of beer. But sometimes you don't want a super heavy, thick stout. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want something that's easy drinking, but you don't want a lager. You want something that's dark and easy. And Guinness is perfect for that. Yep. Yeah. It's an easy drinking stout. It, you know what you're getting every single time. It's consistent. I love Guinness. Yeah. Well, but, thanks for costing us Carling as a potential sponsor on the podcast. <laughs> I don't think we I don't think we have to worry about that. I, I think um, when I was back home in the off season, obviously off season's really long. Yeah, I'd go home over Christmas and stuff. So a few of my mates started drinking it, started drinking it as well. And I think as I matured as a person, I've started to mature in terms of drinking that. And yeah, it was pretty good. I also like Hefeweizen. Yeah, I like Hefeweizen. It's good, nice and light. Yeah, uh, gets the job done. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. My least favorite, uh, Lucas, would because I know you asked, uh, was any IPA. I need chance to get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. IPAs. I don't like it's ridiculous. I don't like them. I really don't. Bullet, I don't like it. It just tastes like pine. Well, I don't like either one of you. So I like that. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, we'll, we'll be over here not drinking IPA. Uh, I, and again, I like I like anything you know dark and malty. Um, you can throw a little bit of like cinnamon in there. I like a good like cinnamon stout would be good. People got into the biscuit Cheeto brews for a while. Yeah, I love and those. those were love those. On real good. Yeah, absolutely. But IPAs are the best. All right, so that's your first. What's your worst? The lemon doesn't exist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I, get, I, get, I, I hate to say this because it's the only one that immediately stands out in my mind. I'm not a big fan of the pickle beer. Oh but... yeah, pickle down economics. I love you, Bosque. Yeah. I love you so much. You make so many great beers. Pickle beers. No. I don't I mean, it's subscribe for pickle beers. I don't like pickle beers. Also, is there a thing in America where people put pickles in beer? So there are pickle flavored beers. It's not, I wouldn't say it's very common. It we happens from time to time. We literally have a can. We have one. So it's good. You want to try it right here on the <laughs> Yeah. It's oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well done, Hersey. Oh, sure. Well done. Uh, but it's like I said, I love Bosque. Bosque is one of my favorite breweries in, in the state. I just can't do pickle beer. I can't do pickle beer either. Yeah. And Zach Prince, we would have never given him a beer. We were responsible. <laughs> but he we're passed. Not, but not. He, he, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> just <laughs> not, not doing it. Not no, doing no, it. No, get <laughs> it out of here. <laughs> All right. Uh, first, first, yeah. Greg Hurst, your second to last one here. American food. Oh, that's a good question. Um, Which fried thing is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> first would probably be, to be fair, a good American burger. Oh, yeah. Doesn't. It's Always. hard to beat that. Yeah. Like, What's the burger scene in Scotland? Is it is it strong? Um, There's a good burger scene in, in England. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, burgers there are good. The best ones you get in the UK, I'd say, is the ones in the little vans outside stadiums. Yep. Yeah. They're like three pounds. And they're not real meat, but they're tasty. <laughs> <unbelievable. laughs> uh, they're supporter. some sort of meat. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm an Arsenal supporter. Uh, and my, you know, Chanel, we went for our honeymoon. We were in London and we went to the Emirates. We were, saw the North London Derby at the Emirates. Dream come true. It was amazing. Um, all the trucks on the outside, we, what we did was we took like little pieces of it. We got the smallest thing on the menu at each of these trucks, like three or four different trucks. It was so good. The sausage roll, the little, they had a little burger there. Oh my God. It was so good. Like the burgers there are really solid. Yeah, it probably wasn't three or four pounds in London. No, it was not. It was not. It was like 10 pounds. What, what's the American food that horrified you when you came over here and you're like, oh my God, they eat that. Pickle beer. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's something I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, oh, it's the worst. 
I know what mine is, and it is a candy going back to earlier, but if you've ever experienced a circus peanut. Oh, those are terrible. I'm sorry. Yeah, those are horrendous. I'm sorry we did that to you. Lucinda, have you had circus peanuts? Oh, I bet you like those two black licorice. licorice oh, we got our first Lucinda. spam comment. I'm getting rid of that one. <laughs> sorry, Rosel Maya, you're not a real person. She's about to get in there. <laughs> I love circus peanuts, Lucas. I think I'm going to you be some mean. I think it's corn dogs, actually. I love corn dogs. Get out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're not the best for you, so I don't really eat them. I mean, much, the concept of a corn dog, if you take the time to think about it and you yeah. never have one, it sounds disgusting. But then again, growing up, we used to eat deep fried Mars bars. So. Oh, that actually sounds really good. That's, that's, that's unbelievable. Have, have, you, had, have like you had fried Oreos? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, so good. Yeah. Um, but corn dogs, I think it's, Can't wait I think it's the, the concept. Fair. I think it's the concept. Yeah, you're going to the state fair. I mean, you're going to eat corn dogs and you're going to you're gonna retract to that heinous. Actually, popcorn. Heretical popcorn. Heretical What's that, buttered popcorn? popcorn? Yeah. Putting butter on popcorn for me is... Why? Bizarre. Just because just because it's like overwhelmingly fatty? Yeah. Yeah. And like it is weird. If back you think home, about it. anytime you go it's sweet or sour. So all right, I'm glad you brought that up. My favorite topping on popcorn, cinnamon. You put cinnamon on popcorn, it is so good. There is okay. if the Jean Cocteau Theater in Santa Fe, they do like fancy hoity twenty movies, but I really like going there. Um, they have like a little stand where they you can put the cheese on it or whatever you want to do. I put the cinnamon on it. Oh my god, it's so good. It's sweet and salty. You know what else they put on it? Butter. Yeah, I mean that's all. I also just like that. again a box of popcorn and put butter on it for me. It's just wild. I just don't like it. It's very fat. <laughs> it's it's not helping. Yeah, Nobody's saying well, every time I say so. that, people that live here that are American think I'm on a different planet. Do you but do you like traditionally Scottish food then? Mm-hmm. Like so on haggis. Do you like haggis? I love haggis. There you go. Yeah, so obviously. but yeah. but people from here are like, ooh, haggis. Well, it's good. I, I've never had I mean I wouldn't have it here. Well, sure. <laughs> well, it's like I can't find a real Philly cheesesteak around here either. I've yeah. been looking. I've been well, apparently I wouldn't with... order buttered popcorn in Scotland. So. <laughs> I don't think I'd be allowed. Yeah. Like... All right. All right. This um, is out of control. This one is directly from my source, and this is the last one. You've been a great sport. Thank you for putting up with Your all source of is 0 for 1 so far. So. <laughs> yeah, but the, he, he was really in on this. One. He, okay. He all would right. like to know. First and worst with Greg Hurst. The Fantasy Premier League, all of the members of the team are participating in right now. Okay, so whoever's at the top is the person who your source is. Is that what the thing right now? I don't know exactly who the source is. Okay. <laughs> Go on, then. Who's leading? Um, I'm actually not in it. Okay. It's a joint league. But where would you be? We figured out when they played yesterday, I'd be third, I think. No, oh, maybe fourth. He's an honest guy. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure. So whoever is leading is currently, whoever is currently leading is the source, I would imagine. I don't think it is. Okay. I think the source might be third or second. <laughs> All right, who the hell is? <laughs> I think first might be four. <gasps> Incorrect. Four? Is it not? It's not. According. Well, again, the source has proved to be unreliable. I don't know if I can <laughs> they trust They don't even it. know their own name. I don't even know if I can trust him anymore. Is, is Brucey first? Brucey is first. Uh, is he the source? He is. Okay. Of course, of course, of course, yeah. Yeah. Ford is number two. Justin Portillo is number three. Yeah. Wait, wait. Let's see if you can get the, the worst. Who's the worst? Oh, you only showed me the top. I think I don't know all the boys. Who's around. in the relegation scrap? Uh, and he only sent me five. I don't know if there's oh, just okay. five. No, there's, I think there's more than five. Okay, well, he just sent me the five. So, yeah. Brucey, you're unreliable. Really, really poor job producing. I know why I said. I know why I said suspicious minds. On. I'll get more credit for that. <laughs> I know why he said that. He's probably he's close to being right. All right. Very a karaoke song of choice. According to his list, uh, Caitlin is currently in fifth. Okay. Better than Chelsea. hey Whoa, I hope he's listening. They're Take a, that. They're an 11. <laughs> they're closer to relegation than they are to the top. Kenny's four. the coolest ride. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So as we wrap up, uh, what was a great <laughs> Poorly, game. poorly wrap up. Great game. First from Uh What we do at the end of every episode is we allow our guest to have a point for a minute. You can shout out whoever you want. You can spread a message that you want. You know, say hi to mom and dad, whatever it is, but the floor is yours, Mr. Herbst. I think, first of all, there's a something going around that me and Josh Dolling are very rarely seen apart. I've noticed a lot of people commenting on that. Oh, really? Um, Dolls is great. I love Josh Dolling. What a guy. Yeah. Um, and we turned up to the black and yellow bash, and I think it was, I can't remember who it was, someone said, like, we're standing next to church and then they came up and they're like, why are you guys always together? Like you're never not together. Um, so is that true? all my business? I mean, it is true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not wrong with that. Two great laughs. Um, <laughs> nah, he's a good laugh. Yeah. Like, we've got a good group going. Um, 
but also just can't wait to get out um, in front of the fans against San Diego. Um, I think all the boys are buzzing for it. Um, get back in front of the, the home crowd. It's you know it's always tough starting the season with three road trips. Yeah. Um, obviously got a home game tomorrow in the Open Cup, but it's, and we're looking forward to that. Yeah. But it's not it's not it's not the same. No, it's not. And um, I think it'll be a great game. Looking forward to it. It's always Open Cup's always a tough game. And no matter who you're playing, you know if you lose, you're out. Um, so really important game, and you know hopefully we get the job done there, and then Monterey following weekend, and then. I think the one that everybody's looking forward to is uh, the home game against San Diego. So is it right. tough to uh, to not look ahead though? As yeah. yeah, I think there's always certain games when the fixtures come out that you look forward to, and obviously the home opener is the main one, um, along with others. But the Open Cup as well is one you know you want to get the date right for that because it's such a historic tournament, and you know it's been proven in the last couple of years that. USL teams can go far in that, so hopefully we can, you know, have a good run at it this year. It um, is weird to have the first home game of the season be the Open Cup. I've never seen that before. Yeah, um, I think when the schedule came out, it's we kind of looked at that and it was a bit. You're not buzzing that sure. you've got three away games in a row, but also if you can, you know, if we can come back from that with a decent amount of points and. If you can beat Monterey, yeah. you're coming back with six points from your first three on the road, yeah. and then you've got more home matches left than anybody else. That's a good. That's a good place to be. I think obviously everybody was disappointed um, on Saturday. Sure. Um, you know, I think we at least wanted to get a point out of that game. Uh, we know we're good enough to do it. Um, it was just one of those games, um, but we have to get over that, look on to the next one. And like you say, if we beat Monterey, come back six points from three games, get our home crowd in front of us, and you know, I think it will set us up for a good season. Yeah, we're going to throw a hell of a party for you, man. For sure. It's going to be a lot of fun. Greg Hurst, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, again, looking forward to the Open Cup match tomorrow, and then we'll be watching in Monterey on Saturday. Can't wait. All right, Lucas, we will not be back next week. We're taking a week off because we are having supporters group meetings next week. Looking forward to those, hanging out with supporters group leadership. Uh, but we'll be back the week after that. Until then, my friend, Somos Unidos. We are united.